Order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. We will start with listed questions. And I call Mr. Barry Michael Duff. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, my department has been working closely with the sector in identifying appropriate updates to Northern Ireland legislation. This will be achieved by way of the introduction of an Assembly Bill. The Bill will remove restrictions on Northern Ireland credit unions and thereby permit them to expand further the range of services that they offer to reach out to new groups. Following a public consultation in summer of 2013, I wrote to the Enterprise Trade and Investment Committee in December 2013 with policy proposals for the legislation. Following a number of queries raised by the committee, which have now been answered, I would hope to bring the draft bill to the Executive in early May 2015, with a view to introduction in the Assembly soon after. Mr. Michael Duff. I can I thank the Minister for her reply, for her answer, uh, particularly a reference to the notion of removing restrictions, but can I ask the Minister if she or her department have given consideration to enabling credit unions to provide financial support to local businesses, uh, and you know, most typically SMEs, small, medium-sized enterprises? Uh, well, absolutely, and, and indeed that is part of uh, what we hope will be achieved uh, by uh, this bill, that uh, services from the credit unions will be more widely available. Uh, I also say that in the context of the fact that there are and have been a number of uh, bank closures in rural areas over this past period of time, and I, I do recognise that that can be a difficulty, particularly for uh, individuals and small businesses who perhaps don't have cause to go uh, to the larger towns where the banks are now uh, situated. And it was an issue actually that was uh, acknowledged by the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee report on banking. Uh, when they say that uh, in relation to bank closures, they recognise that the bank's position is that the closures are inevitable um, due to a decline in branch transactions. However, it could leave potentially customers financially excluded, particularly in rural areas. And I'm sure that's an issue uh, that the member, bearing in mind his constituency and my own constituency, will have concern in relation to. So I'm hoping um, that post offices in particular and credit unions will be able to fill that gap. Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers today. I think we all recognise the need for the change in legislation and the reform to credit unions, and we all see it as very important. Will the Minister give us a firm commitment to this House that she will do all she can to get those amendments pushed through in the current mandate? Well, certainly uh, it has always been my hope and desire that we will be able to do that. As I have uh, indicated, the uh, committee hopefully has finished its stage uh, now, and I will be able to take uh, a paper to the executive hopefully in May of this year and then uh, introduce the matter into the House. I know that time may not be on uh, my side in relation to this matter, but I am hopeful that we will be able to deal with it in this mandate. Well, Mr Dominic Bradley. Um, I thank the Minister for her uh, answer. Could I ask the Minister, um, are there any additional measures which her department uh, can take to encourage more people to use credit unions rather than go to pay their loan companies? And this is an issue that has caused us grave concern, particularly um, through the work that we have carried out in our financial capability strategy, that there are those who feel that they have no other option um, but to seek uh, loans. Maybe not that concerned about the payday loans, even though uh, they can cause grave difficulties. They have their place, but it is the loan sharks and the unregulated loans that cause us uh, the deepest concern. Uh, the, the Department of Social Development and my colleague uh, Minister Storey have been looking at ways in which uh, they can work with the credit union uh, movement uh, in order to allow uh, people perhaps on low income to access financial products. And I do know that that department uh, are engaged in running two pilots, um, and uh, that is really to try and see what support is required um, to help those credit unions that may need help in relation to the provision of longer opening hours, um, in provision of training uh, for staff or volunteers, provision of marketing material. And then the second proposal is to look at the feasibility of supporting credit unions to provide enhanced banking services and products, and that is really in the context uh, of benefits. So, 
Department of Social Development, my own department, indeed DARD, we've all been engaged in working with the credit union movement, and that will be the case, I think, into the future as well. Will members please note before I proceed to question two that questions 7, 12 and 13 have been withdrawn. I call Ms Michaela Boyd. Question two. Uh, my department has engaged extensively with the former councils in the North West to understand the local investment proposition and will continue to do this with the new council. In addition, Invest in I's International Investment Division intends to hold a planning meeting in Londonderry at the end of April 2015. The programme will include meetings with council officials, university and college representatives and other stakeholders with inward, inward investment at the top of its agenda. Ms Boyle for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for her answer and um, just in relation to that, will the Minister uh, along with Invest and I continue to meet with Council representatives and officials to agree uh, targets and outcomes in terms of inward investment and just expanding on investment, um, is the Minister in a position to give an update on the uh, business park within Straban, Gormogut? I thank the member for her question. Uh, indeed, we will continue to work uh, with the, the new council as we have with the previous two councils. Uh, and uh, she may be aware that Invest have uh, agreed to co-fund uh, the development of the integrated economic strategy uh, for the new Derry City Council and Straban Council area. So I, they have agreed to do that, and I wholeheartedly uh, support that. And I was delighted also to see uh, the new app promoting Straban as an investment destination launched uh, on the 10th of March of this year uh, and again they have highlighted uh, the inward investments that are already there and just to her second point uh, made everyone aware of the fact that there, there is land available in the Straban area and to market that land to uh, inward investors and indeed to investors uh, who maybe uh, want to set up business in Straban from within Northern Ireland. Well, Mr Thomas Buchanan. Thank you, uh Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Does the Minister agree that the extension of the gas network to the West will not only be a significant boost to existing businesses, but will also be an attraction to new businesses and a help to inward investment in the West? Well, of course, I'm particularly delighted to see the progress that has been made in relation to the uh, Gas to the West project. Um, indeed, the, uh, question, the first question from Ms. Boyle is in relation to Straban, and it is to Straban um, that the gas network will be ex extended first. Um, Work is going to commence later uh, this year uh, in relation to that part of the pipeline, uh, with the first customer we hope uh, connected in 2016. And the main pipeline works to provide uh, for the connections in the West uh, are planned to commence uh, for the other part of the Gas to the West project, uh, that is to Dungannon, Coal Island, Cookstown, Mackerfeld, Oma and Inniskillen, along with Daryl in 2016 and should be completed in 2017. And we should really uh, be cognizant of the importance of this piece of infrastructure because it will give individuals a chance to connect to natural gas, but as well as that will be part of the investment story for the West of the province and uh, it's something that we should all welcome. Well, Mr. Sam Gardner. Deputy Speaker, does the Minister agree that attracting inward investment should remain primary and invest Northern Ireland rule, but that new super councils in their enhanced economic development role can make their areas more attractive places to do business in? Well, absolutely, and that's the point I have been making for quite some time uh, now that. The, the new super councils have very much uh, an enhanced role with their new powers that they have been given, um, particularly in relation to start a business and social entrepreneurship, um, and indeed with others uh, who want to uh, start uh, up, uh, particularly young people. They're, they have been given powers in that regard as well. Uh, but just overall, in the sense of promoting the area as a good place to do business in. And I'm sure he was delighted to see the announcement that we made just recently uh, in Craig Avon, uh, where we had 320 jobs announced uh, for his area. That was a tremendous announcement and one I was very pleased to make. Mr. Pat Sheehan for a question. Last count, Corla, question three. Please. 
Uh, my department and the Department for Employment and Learning, in conjunction with the Department for Social Development, the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety and Invest Northern Ireland, have developed a draft strategy to reduce the high levels of economic inactivity in Northern Ireland. The draft strategy seeks to help key economically inactive groups make the transition towards and into the labour market. The draft strategy is currently with the Executive for consideration. Once agreed, we will commence implementation at the earliest opportunity. Mr. Sheehan for a supplement. I will ask Count Corlogos go and break a selection era, suck the fragra. I thank the Minister for her answer. I am sure she will be aware that West Belfast has one of the, the highest rates of economic inactivity across these islands. And I wonder could the Minister tell us what specific actions are being taken to create job opportunities for people in West Belfast? Well, I'm uh, pleased that Sinn Féin have now agreed to allow this matter to go on to the executive agenda and that we will be able to have the matter before the executive, uh, hopefully on Thursday, because uh, the strategy does have uh, particular actions in it which I think will be of use to the member in his own constituency and indeed to, to many members across Northern Ireland. Um, but it will have competitive pilot testing uh, in terms of innovative ways to try and deal uh, with the economic inactivity that persists as a, a legacy issue uh, for Northern Ireland. Uh, and it's also going to establish and facilitate a strategic forum to oversee strategic uh, delivery issues as well. Uh, and whilst the member makes the point about wealth spell fast, and I acknowledge uh, the point that he makes in relation to uh, economic inactivity there, uh, the latest figures do show that there has been uh, a sustained fall in the number of people claiming unemployment benefits uh, in West Belfast since 2013, something which uh, I hope he will welcome, as indeed I do. Uh, but there is uh, much more work to be done, uh, and with this strategy in place, hopefully uh, after the executive this week, it is something that we will be able to take forward. Paul Lord Morrow. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister, just in relation to the question that has been asked, surely there is something hypocritical about Sinn Féin's position here in relation to welfare reform, where many from that constituency are being deprived because of the inactivity and the inaction of the party opposite? Well, there is no doubt that uh, uh, the inertia that seems to have arrived uh, within Sinn Féin at the moment in dealing with the Stormont House Agreement uh, is something to be deeply regretted, uh, because I believe that we need to get on and deal with the issues that were agreed back in December. Uh, that will free us up to deal with all of the issues on the agenda, including uh, dealing with corporation tax, because of course we haven't had the opportunity uh, to set the date and the rate as yet, because we are in a state of limbo in relation to corporation tax until the welfare reforms, which were agreed in December, are implemented. Call Mr. Robin Swan. Uh, Minister, there is a target within the Executive's economic inactivity strategy of an employment rate of over 70 per cent by 2023. Does the Minister think this will be achievable? Well, yes, I do, uh, particularly if we are able to uh, continue upon the route of the devolution of corporation tax, because, as I'm sure he's aware, looking at the studies from the Northern Ireland Centre for Economic Policies, now the Ulster University Business School, they are indicating that that's going to grow the economy by 10 11 per cent. So that will allow us to employ more people uh, right across Northern Ireland and will deal with some of the legacy issues that we have had to deal with over this past period of time. I mean, it is true that we do have the highest economic inactivity uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, next to us is Wales with 25.6 uh, per cent and uh, the North West of England on 24 per cent. We currently stand at 27.8 per cent and that is something that we need to tackle. We have recognised that and uh, with the strategy in place uh, after the executive we hope this week we will be able to move forward. Well, Mr Jim Allister. Does the Minister agree that the member who asked the question and his party by opposing all aspects of welfare reform are in fact blocking any incentivising of the economic in, economically inactive into work? And does she accept that incentivising the economically inactive into work has to be part of a viable economic strategy? 
Well, I do think that we have to look at new and innovative ways to try and incentivise people uh, into work. There are those who aren't uh, in work at present uh, because of deep-seated problems, some of them uh, mental health problems, and there needs to be uh, issues addressed. And that's why the Department of Health and Social Services uh, were involved in the formulation uh, of the strategy. But there is no doubt that there are those who uh, are on welfare and don't believe it would benefit them to go and work because it would disadvantage them. Uh, and I think for those people, uh, we need to incentivise them into work because work is not just good in terms of bringing home a wage at the end of the week or at the end of the month, but it is good for one's mental health. And, and to be able to uh, engage in gainful employment is good generally for the society and the community with which, within which uh, people dwell. Call Mr. Cahill Boylan for a question. Mr. Cahill, let a hold and ask on corner. Question number four, please. The All Ireland market is an important market for many of our businesses, large and small, and specific industry sectors such as construction and food continue to deliver significant sales across the island. Invest Northern Ireland works directly with many of those businesses to support and assist their export plans. The Trade and Business Development Body, Intertrade Ireland, offers uh, practical cross-border funding information, advice and support to small and medium-sized enterprises in both jurisdictions and continues to develop an environment in which the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland cooperate to ensure SMEs are making full use of cross-border opportunities to drive competitiveness, growth and jobs. Intertrade Ireland also supports businesses through its innovation and trade programmes to take advantage of north-south cooperation opportunities to improve capability and drive competitiveness, jobs and growth. Mr Boylan for a supplementary. I'm going to thank the Minister for her answer, but could I ask the Minister, has she any other proposals to ensure that we maximise the potential of local firms here in terms of trade? I do say to the member that uh, around two-thirds of our small and medium-sized companies already um, take their first step uh, into exporting by working with their um, nearest neighbours in the Republic of Ireland, and that's their first step into the export market. Uh, indeed, 90% of exporters from Northern Ireland took their first step into exporting by trading across the border first and then uh, looking uh, to new and different markets. So uh, I do think that there's a very healthy cross-border market uh, ongoing, and of course Intertrade Ireland and Invest Northern Ireland will continue to help those companies who want to take that first step. Mr Fergal mm -hmm. McKinney. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for answers thus far. Could you outline what discussions she's had, if any, with the Irish Government and others in relation to the proposed cuts to the budget of Intertrade Ireland? Well, they're not proposed cuts. Those cuts are already uh, in place. Uh, they have been uh, agreed uh, at the last Intertrade sectoral meeting. Uh, and, uh, I think my counterpart, Richard Bruton, uh, understands the uh, issue in relation to Northern Ireland because they have gone through a similar issue in relation to the Republic of Ireland uh, a number of years ago. Mr Paul Given. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister uh, around the fluctuation in the exchange rate and what impact that can be having on our local economy uh, in terms of uh, the Republic of Ireland and then also uh, across Europe in terms of the strengthening pound and the weakening uh, euro? Well, given the answers that I've uh, just made in relation to the number of firms and the percentage of firms that take their first step into exporting by working cross-border, um, it is a very difficult uh, picture at the moment because a stronger pound uh, makes our goods and services more expensive uh, in the eurozone uh, market, not just in the Republic of Ireland. Um, and it's the same uh, as well as for goods, it's the same for tourism as well. Uh, and when considering destinations, uh, of course, tourists are usually price sensitive. Uh, and it could be a barrier uh, to those people who are perhaps looking uh, at coming uh, to Northern Ireland from the Eurozone. However, on a positive note, uh, goods and services such as energy, such as food, which we import from the Eurozone, of course, will be cheaper for businesses and households in Northern Ireland. So I suppose it is a bit of swings and roundabouts, but we totally understand that for those people who are doing business across border, that at the moment it is very difficult. Well, Mr. Stephen Mutry for a question. Question number five, Deputy Speaker. 
According to Ofcom's latest infrastructure report at June 2014, the number of premises that had taken up superfast broadband services in Northern Ireland stood at 22 per cent, having risen by some three percentage points on the previous year. This is on a par with the take-up in England and considerably above the take-up of similar services in Scotland and Wales. Mr. Ministry, for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for her response in relation to this. And it is encouraging to uh, know that we're on a par with other regions in the United Kingdom. Can the Minister expand, as you were in the Southern Ireland, what the take-up is? Um, I don't have the figures for uh, the Republic of Ireland because we do work within the United Kingdom system and we're usually, when we look at Ofcom, um, looking at how the other regions of the UK are doing. Uh, I, I will say to the member that, uh, particularly in Wales and Scotland, that they look sometimes at Northern Ireland with envy, in particular in relation to some of the schemes that we've been able uh, to roll out, uh, whether that's the Northern Ireland Broadband Improvement Project, uh, the Superfast Rollout programme, which we have just begun uh, in February of this year, or the Superfast Connected Cities programme, which we are hoping to expand beyond Londonderry and Belfast and into the rest of Northern Ireland. So there is quite a lot going on in relation to broadband at the moment, uh, but we make no apology for that because we do want to retain our position uh, in terms of the number one in, in, in the UK. Call Mr. Mickey Brady for a question. Gorham, I got uh, last concordia. I thank the minister for her answer so far. Could I ask the min minister what level of investment in superfast broadband is provided in Uri and Armagh? Gorham, I got. Well, in terms of the superfast rollout programme, um, that's a, a £17 million uh, programme which has just begun, and the coverage is going to be extended to over 38,000 premises by 2017. As it's a programme that has just begun, we don't have the figures uh, for Nuri and Armagh at present. Uh, in terms of the Super Connected Cities programme, um, that is a programme that started life uh, as a voucher scheme in Belfast where businesses could apply for a £3,000 voucher. Uh, it then was rolled out to uh, our second city in Londonderry and now it is going to be available for councils to bid into right across Northern Ireland. And I would encourage councils, uh, whether it is in, in the members' area or indeed any other member uh, uh, throughout Northern Ireland, to encourage their councils to apply in to this super fast, super connected cities programme. It is a bit of a misnomer in, in so far as it's, it started life as a cities programme, but it is now going to be available right across Northern Ireland. Well, Mr Joe Byrne for a supplement. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister how happy or content is she with the different schemes that Eddie and Dard have tried to promote over the last number of years, when there are still queries about reliability and speeds, when can we have 100 per cent coverage of fixed wire fibre optic cabling throughout Northern Ireland? Well, I will say to the member, it is going to be a long time before we have 100 per cent fibre to every home in Northern Ireland. Um, what we are trying to do at the moment is ensure that there is fibre to the Cabinet uh, in terms of some of the schemes that we have been involved in. Uh, fibre to the home, of course, is more expensive again. What we want to ensure is that uh, through the Broadband Improvement Project, which is still ongoing uh, and, and does not finish to the end uh, of this year, and so I do accept that there are still some areas that have to be uh, dealt with, uh, what we are trying to do is to make sure that people have a basic broadband uh, in certain areas that they have no service, uh, and to improve broadband services where choices poor or speeds are low. So that is what we are engaged in at the present moment in time. Uh, but I do say, Deputy Speaker, it will be a very long time before we have fibre to every home in Northern Ireland. Mrs Sandra Overend for a question. Question six, please. As a statutory partner in community planning, Invest Northern Ireland have been actively working with council officials and elected representatives in relation to the transfer of functions and its community planning initiatives or activities. While no formal training has been provided to local councillors in advance of the transfer of new economic powers, both by my department and Invest NI, we are both committed to continuing to provide as much ongoing support and guidance as may be required. Mrs. Sandra, over in for a supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I appreciate that officers have a crucial role to play in this. Uh, but will the minister uh, liaise with the Department of Environment minister regarding training needs for uh, both councillors and officers? A lot of attention has been paid uh, to planning in the new to planning powers in the new councils. Um, but does she agree that the new local economic development powers uh, are equally important for the, the new local councils? Well, the new powers that are being devolved from Invest Northern Ireland are the enterprise awareness, the start a business activity and the social enterprise, so they are not as comprehensive, uh, I acknowledge, as the new planning powers that are being devolved from the Department of Environment. Uh, because of our network of offices across Northern Ireland, uh, the Invest Northern Ireland officials stand ready to work with uh, council officials or indeed council uh, uh, members uh, across Northern Ireland. And indeed, if a request comes in, as hasn't to date, if a request comes in in relation to training, I'm quite sure that the Invest officials will try and facilitate that. Mr. Ian McRae for supplement. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister outline what funding has been allocated down to um, local councils to help them um, with, with the devolution of these powers, and what role that, um, that, that parts of our department will have in respect of community planning? Well, the original allocation to the 11 councils was £3.55 million, um, but as a result of budget restructuring, that, that has been subject uh, to a reduction and the reduced amount transferring is 3.01 million. Um, as I've indicated, uh, economic powers uh, transferring from Invest and I include functions in relation to enterprise awareness, start a business activity and social enterprise. And it's really for the individual councils as to how they wish to exercise those powers. Uh, some may wish to continue with the start a business programme. Um, they will have to procure a, a new contract in relation to that, which ends, I think, in October uh, of this year. Uh, so they may want to do things uh, in a different way that will suit their own particular uh, agenda and indeed their own particular rural area. But we stand ready to help uh, in any way that we can from a strategic point of view. Well, Mr. Alban McGuinness for something. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her very interesting answers. Uh, would the Minister envisage that um, the devolution of more economic power to councils uh, would uh, continue over the years? Uh, because it seems to me that uh, the council, local councils, particularly in rural areas, have a very important and pivotal role to play in economic development. I think it's too soon um, to answer uh, that question as yet because uh, the new powers have just been devolved. Uh, it will be interesting to see the way in which those develop over the next couple of years. Uh, Invest will very much be part of the community planning process at each of the council area levels, so there is that connectivity uh, between regional level and uh, the local council area as well. And that's why when I referred to the app that has been um, set up in Straban. That was a, a piece of collaborative working between Invest NI and uh, the new uh, council, which was in shadow form at that particular point in time. So I'm quite happy to look in the future uh, as to what else can be devolved. But I think at the moment we have devolved some powers and we wait to see how those will be exercised. I call Mr. Paul Girvin for a question. Question number eight. Uh, Invest Northern Ireland releases information at sub-regional level following each financial year end. Therefore, the most up-to-date figures available show that between 1 April 2010 and 31 March 2014, Invest NI offered support to 428 start-up projects in the South Antrim constituency area. Of these projects, 400 were supported indirectly by Invest NI through the Regional Start Initiative, formerly known as the Enterprise Development Programme. For supplementary. I thank the Minister for answers thus far. And it's in relation to businesses which probably have had a major turnaround. I'm thinking of one in particular, which was MyVan uh, Marine Limited, uh, and uh, this time last year in bankruptcy. Just a good news story there. Is there any more information on how that's, that's progressing? 
Well, indeed, and can I commend Brian McConville and his team uh, in My Van Marine Limited. I was due uh, to visit Brian and his team, and unfortunately, uh, due to a death in the family, I wasn't able uh, to attend, but uh, the junior minister attended in my place. And I do understand that things are, are going well. Uh, and My Van Marine Limited, in its first year of trading, achieved profit uh, with a turnover of £9.7 million to the year-end December 2014, and it currently employs 99 full-time staff. I think that is good news uh, for Antrim uh, and my van in particular because, as the member rightly says, it was a very different story some 12 months ago. Order. That ends the period for listed questions. and We will now move on to topical questions. and I call Mr Cahill Boylan. I mean, well, good last time, Carl, and, um, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. We could ask the Minister, given the Minister that the traditional construction industry has provided a lot of employment over the last number of years. Uh, can you confirm whether or not there has been a slight increase in construction activity and how, we, how can we ensure in the future to retain all our local tradesmen, our young tradesmen, instead of losing them out to places like America and Australia? Go remain in the Call the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment. Well, I, I recognise that it has been a concern of members that skills may be lost in the construction arena with young people in particular uh, emigrating uh, to other parts of the world because of the lack of construction jobs available uh, in Northern Ireland. So it's a challenge uh, both for myself and the Minister for Employment and Learning to ensure that those skills uh, are retained and that we continue to provide those skills into the future. We may find ourselves in a situation where we have skill gaps in the future because of the fact that young people have left. And it's something that we do need to be very aware of and make sure that we continue to train young people in those jobs. Because I do believe that construction, um, although uh, again in the last quarter uh, it was down, I do believe there are signs that things are beginning to pick up. And certainly for the first time, I'm seeing construction projects starting all over Northern Ireland. Mr Boylan for a supplement. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I could have thanked the Minister for that answer. But could I ask the Minister what assistance she could provide or talking to other ministers to ensure that local firms can access uh, capital projects through the public procurement uh, process? Well, of course, the public procurement rules are uh, something that sometimes are a mystery to all of us. Uh, but uh, what we have done through Intertrade Ireland is that we have established uh, a go-to-tender programme uh, which allows companies uh, in Northern Ireland to bid in to procurement projects in the Republic of Ireland and vice versa so that they can access those projects uh, on the island. We have supported companies as well who continue to work and perhaps they may be at the moment uh, engaged in projects in Great Britain but they uh, do keep their design uh, facilities and their intellectual property here in Northern Ireland. So we'll continue to work with the construction industry. Mr. Robin Swan for a topical question. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister, along with the Employment and Learning Minister, were appointed by the Executive as a task force to see a future for the Gallagher site and the JTI workers in Balamina. Could you provide an update as to what's happening there? Well, uh, first of all, we weren't appointed as a task force. We were appointed as the two responsible ministers to liaise with the management and workers at Gallagher. We have continued to do that. As he will be aware, uh, there was a proposal put forward between the workers and the local management uh, to the management uh, in Switzerland that was rejected, and therefore uh, Gallagher's management have decided to proceed uh, with the closure of the plant on a phased basis, and they have made uh, particular um, packages, as I understand, available to uh, members of staff, uh, and uh, that process is ongoing. Call Mr Swan for a supplementary. I, I thank the Minister and apologise for, for using the phrase task force. It was incorrect. Uh, the Minister will be aware that I have sort of explored the possibility of creating the area as an enterprise zone. Now, I know the Minister in the past has said it is not her responsibility, but, but one for Westminster. Uh, Matthew Hancock, MP in the Department of Business, said it's up to the executive to approach them. Danny Alexander, MP in Her Majesty's Treasury, actually says it's up to the executive to ask the British government if they would create an enterprise zone in area, any area in Northern Ireland. Would the minister still be willing to explore that as an opportunity? Well, as the member knows, um, the pilot enterprise zone uh, has still to be designated in Coleraine, and whilst there has been 
pro uh, progress in relation to that matter uh, recently between the Council and indeed the private sector uh, in Coleraine. Uh, that matter still uh, remains outstanding. Therefore, we do need to deal with the matter in front of us, which is the Coleraine uh, Enterprise Zone. And in terms of the Enterprise Zone, um, it is a different uh, creature to the creature uh, that was available back in the 1980s in terms of enterprise zones. Uh, we do have planning policy devolved in Northern Ireland, indeed it's devolved now uh, to local councils. Uh, telecoms policy is there. Um, the uh, other issue is in relation to capital allowances, which would be the only issue really that we would have control over, and it's one of the reasons why a data centre is well suited uh, to uh, an enterprise zone. So if the member wants to indicate why he believes that capital allowances would be particularly helpful in relation to the enterprise zone uh, in uh, Ballymena. I'm more than happy to listen to that. Mr Oliver McMullen for a topical question. Can I ask the Minister, can the Minister assure me that with the setting up of the new Midland East Antrim Council and the new Tourism NA that the Antrim Coast and Glens will be um, promoted to the standard set down in your own programme for government? I could make a very short answer to that, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, but absolutely it will be. It's one of the nine tourism destinations and one uh, that the members of his area should be very proud of. I did have the opportunity uh, to visit the White Rocks recently and to see the new facilities that are there, and I would encourage all members who haven't been to visit that, that new facility that they should do so. Well, Mr McMullen for a supplementary. Thank you. And, and indeed, we are quite proud of having it included in the programme for government. But, Minister, the Mid Glens, from, from Glenarm, Carnock, right down into the Mid Glens, is sadly lacking and have been for a number of years. And we only have to look at the promenade in Carnock to see that. Can you assure me that that Mid Glens will get the share of promotion that it, 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 it uh, desires? On the back of, say, for example, the Giro d'Italia, where you get the iconic photographs and pictures of the horses and the beaches in Carnock. We haven't capitalised on those, on those worldwide uh, pictures. Well, to be fair, if you haven't capitalised on those worldwide pictures, one has to ask why not. Uh, because uh, those were really iconic pictures. And uh, I do recall on a debate on the Mid Glens recently, we were treated to the Deputy Speaker uh, telling us all about the different glens in and around uh, uh, the Glens of Antrim, which was uh, very enjoyable. But you know, people have to come forward with applications uh, to Tourism NI, uh, and I very much hope that they do so, and I understand that they have in relation to the Tourism Events Fund. And I am sure that the member like myself, is very much looking forward to the opening of the Gobbins Pass, uh, which will be an outstanding uh, a tourist attraction to his particular area, and I hope that his new council will take full benefit of it. Mrs Judith Cochrane for a topical question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, given the Minister's good record of attracting foreign direct investment and major sporting events to Northern Ireland, does the Minister share my concern that the proposed conscience clause in Northern Ireland could have implications similar to the business and sporting uh, boycott of the State of Indiana following the introduction of similar legislation? Uh, well, no, I don't share her concerns at all. Um, I do have to say to the member, however, that what does concern me is the number of small businesses that have approached uh, me individually and many of my colleagues in relation to the concerns they have uh, about the provision of services in the future. It is a concern that she would do well and her party would do well to acknowledge as well because we are not just interested in foreign direct investment, we are also very much interested in our Indigenous companies. Mrs Cochran for supplementary. Uh, thank you, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, and I do take that point on board, but I mean, there were a number of, of concerts cancelled, sponsorships for major tech conferences were, was pulled out, planned, 40 million expansion of a company headquarters was cancelled, um, all to do with that. And, and I do think that that is a major issue. But uh, does the Minister um, understand that encouraging um, foreign investment and also encouraging tourism is a difficult enough job? without these added hurdles um, and you know hurdles such as this or the negative comments per perhaps that came from the likes of Kit Harrington? Well can I say to the member I could do well as indeed could our most major um, investor in Northern Ireland do well without the comments of her colleague uh, Naomi Long about Bombardier yesterday. 
because I have been in contact uh, with Bombardier. Uh, they are very concerned about the comments that have been made because Bombardier are completely committed to Northern Ireland. They are uh, committed to Northern Ireland because of the workforce that there is here. And to suggest uh, that they would do otherwise in terms of uh, a referendum on the European Union, when the company have made it particularly clear that they do not have a particular stance on uh, the UK referendum, if indeed it, it happens after the general election. It is irresponsible, and I am hugely surprised that uh, a, a, a current Member of Parliament should say such a thing in relation to our biggest investor in Northern Ireland. And, you know, I hope uh, that the member who has made the comments reflects on the comments and indeed apologises to Pombardi for the embarrassment that she has caused. Uh, the member listed for topical question five has withdrawn their name. I now move on to Mr Ian Mill. The Minister for Assessment of the Importance to the Economy of Plans by Concentrix and Allstate uh, to build and develop their new headquarters in Belfast. Well, uh, Allstate uh, and Concentrix are two very important uh, foreign direct investors in Northern Ireland. Uh, I have met with senior teams from uh, both of those organisations uh, recently, and I am aware that both of those organisations have plans for expansion uh, in Belfast, and both have recently submitted planning applications uh, for new developments which will be in front uh, of the new Belfast Council, and I hope that they will be able to develop in the way in which they have said they want to. Mr. Milne for supplementary. For my good day, Alaska and Kool, your August, my weakest on air, Kutina Fregory, Kutisho. And uh, thank you, Minister, and thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, thus far. Um, do you believe that this development there can uh, result in more really well paid jobs? Kuramagut. Well, I certainly know that uh, all state and concentrics have ambitious plans. Um, they want to be on the uh, former Maysfield Leisure Centre site um, by um, early uh, in, in a few months' time, uh, and they want to be on those, that site. Both of the companies want to be on site because they have plans for expansion in the future, and I think we should uh, very much uh, welcome that. And we should also uh, hope that uh, Belfast uh, Council will work with both of the companies to make sure that the plans go ahead. Mr. Colum Eastwood for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for answers thus far? Uh, can I ask her, in her view, what are the major barriers to uh, the attraction of foreign direct investment to the Foyle constituency? <laughs> well, um, I think that there are legacy issues in relation to uh, economic inactivity in that constituency, uh, which the member is well aware of. There are issues in relation to youth uh, unemployment in that city. And certainly when I met with his colleague, Mr. Ramsey, in relation to the economic inactivity draft strategy, he had hopes that he would be able to use that strategy and indeed the pilots that would come out of that strategy to help to deal with those. Uh, and I call them legacy issues because they have been there for a period of time and therefore that's why there is a real need to deal with those issues. Mr Eastwood for supplement. Th thank the Minister uh, for her answer and, and I agree with her. But does she agree with me that without uh, proper investment in the road network to the city, and a proper investment into the expansion of McGee University that we won't reach our economic potential and we won't be able to attract high-end uh, foreign direct investment to the city. Well, he's actually picked up on a, a subject that I had a discussion uh, with the Chamber of Commerce in Londonderry about uh, recently uh, and what I said to them was it's not just about um, looking at the number of jobs that come to the city, it is about the ecosystem in the, in the city and from out from going out of the city and so roads is critical. Uh, telecoms infrastructure is critical and he will know that the telecoms infrastructure within uh, the city is very, very good and is a legacy of actually the city of culture that took place there. So there is much uh, to talk about in terms of the future of the city and its economic prospects but he is right to talk about the infrastructure uh, as well as just looking at the Invest NI job numbers. Uh, 
Ms. Katrina Ruan is not in her place. The member for question nine for, has withdrawn their name, and Mr. Michael McJimsey is not in his place. I ask members to take their ease for a moment until questions to the Minister for the Environment begin at 2.45.